hard things. It's not easy things. It's hard things. And that's why he gives us the strength that we need to walk through the hard times. Amen? Knowing that you're going to get to the other side, no matter what you feel today, he said that he, that you can do all things through Christ who will give you the strength. Amen? Songbooks to page 13 for Blessed are the Poor in Spirit. Again, that's page 13. Matthew 5 3 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes.
and you will be invited to take the bread of Christ, the body of Christ, which is broken for you. You just take it off of this very slippery <laughs> plate. And it's, if you, it's okay. This is a table of grace. So don't worry about it. Take your time. And then take it and you dip it into the cup. And you say, this is the blood of Christ who is, that is shed for you. This blood is shed for you. And you take both together. And that's how that is done. You go back to your seat and pray and thank the Lord for what he has done for you. So now, in the same manner, that night, that night our Lord was betrayed. When he picked up the bread as it came around to him, he said, From now on, whenever you partake of this bread, remember, remember, don't forget, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner also as the cup was being passed around he said from now on whenever you partake of this cup remember don't forget this is my blood which is shed for you so Lord Jesus Christ what a gift grace undeserved and we pray forgive us our debts these are debts we could never ever ever ever
God is good. All the time. What a wonderful God we serve. He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen. Amen. He forgives all of our sins and our trespasses. All we have to do is ask. He provides everything we need. If you need healing this morning, ask for it. If you need employment, ask for it. If you know someone that needs help, pray for them and ask for it. Let's rejoice in the spirit of the Lord that's in this place. This is his temple. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, it is with gratitude that we come before your throne humbly, dear Heavenly Father, thanking you for all that you've done for us. Dear Heavenly Father, may the blood of Christ and his body, the body of Christ, just ooze through our spirits, dear Heavenly Father, and may we be set free from any shackles that may be binding us. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray for inordinate good health and long life. Because by His stripes, we are healed, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for blessing the message today. We thank you for the worship that has already transpired. We pray, dear God, that your presence is thick on the hearts, the spirits, the minds of the bodies of those that are here today. We love you, dear Heavenly Father, and we are thankful that you love us. We give you all glory and honor in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be from Matthews 3, verses 13 to 17. The Baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son! whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. God's word is alive. Yes. It's alive. It's yes. alive. It's alive. And I know because we were adopted into the kingdom of Almighty God, I know that we are sons and daughters of God. And he loves us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today we will be receiving your tithes and your offerings. And those that are helping us out by donating on the internet, we'd like to thank you as well. And we'd like to ask you to continue to support Hope Center of Christ. And also we'd like to invite you to go to our website at hopecenterofchristoc.org. There you can find out more information regarding Hope Center of Christ. I'd like to remind those that are here today and those that are viewing on the internet that the pastor will be launching the heart of a warrior. She will be launching that, so stay tuned for that. She may be because we have to stand in the gap for our children for our children. Amen, amen. On September the 11th, 
Mark it on your calendar because after service on September the 11th, we will be saying goodbye to our friend Kathy King, who has already received a, a heavenly reception from Almighty God. She had a wonderful love for her Jesus, for her God. So next week, let's come together after service and remember our friend. Let's remember her. I'm thinking about something that will make me laugh about Kathy King. <laughs> that they were told at the women's ministry one night, and it got to me. Somebody said, no, 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 no. I dropped my notes, but I won't go down and get them. <laughs> because I know this, because Kathy King is so special. She was so special to our ministry. So next Sunday after, after the service, stay behind. Don't rush out. Stay behind. Let's pay homage to Kathy. Let's, let's lift her up in prayer. Let's say all goodbyes to her. And then after that, some of us are going to be going over to Woody's to break bread together. Now here's the secret. We want everyone to come, but bring your own dollar bills. Bring your own money because Kathy King, I don't think her family would be involved with this. This is something that the church would like to do together. However, I'll, we would like for you to pay for your own bill. Do they call that Dutch? Yes, Dutch. Yes. Amen. It took me a long time to understand what Dutch was. Because I ain't, I ain't, I ain't California either. <laughs> In Virginia, I didn't hear anything about Dutch, right? So, so yeah, so it's Dutch. Just, just so come along. If, if you don't have, a, if you don't have nothing but a dollar bill, we get you a cup of coffee. Amen. Amen. The most important thing is that you bring your heart and sit around and share some of the precious moments that you have about Kathy King. That's what we want you to do. And please join us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for our ties at all. Dear Heavenly Father, we can never outgive you. And we're always blessed. We're blessed coming and going. Whether we know it or not, dear Heavenly Father, we know that we are blessed because you said we should call out unto you. You will hear us. And so, dear Heavenly Father, it is with a cheerful heart that we bring our tithes and our offerings into your storehouse. And we bring it through obedience, dear Heavenly Father, and through faith that you supply all of our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Receive our offerings today. And dear Heavenly Father, if we don't get a chance, we just like to say, bless our potluck meal that we will have today. We pray that it would nourish our bodies and our minds and would bring us closer together as a family here at Oaks and Christ. May everyone participate, whether they want anything or not. And dear God, we just thank you for the, for the abundance that you give us. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Darrell. Yes, it is wrong. And also, I just want to add really quickly, um, Debbie Bonilla said that it's Kathy's birthday today. Yes, yeah. And then for our next song, go ahead and turn in your songbooks to page 65. Or press down, shaking together, and running on. 65.
Today is Kathy's birthday. And when that was announced, little Timsy said, and JJ's. It's also JJ's birthday. So we need to sing happy birthday to Kathy and JJ, right? All right, and that's why I need your help, all right? Because 
that we want as many printed as possible. The printed versions are, are seed. You can't share your Kindle version, but we want you to give a printed version to a pastor or a friend. Pray for the prayer, ask God in prayer, who do you want me to give this to, Lord? So that's that's what I'm asking. I think that's what the Lord wants us, how he wants us to get the word out. These are seeds to disseminate, okay? Book is just, the book is just a mechanism to launch a prayer movement. It's all about the prayer movement. It's all about getting people to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, to pray, okay? And so today, it's all about the sword. It's all about the sword. Keep your sword sharpened and unsheathed. Mm. I've already given you four messages, and there's the, in the book there's four chapters on igniting your that burning heart of the Father within you to pray, how to strengthen that heart of a warrior with worship, and how the heart of a warrior can be forged in the furnace. It's all about that heart. And now we are at the point, and how to stay protected now, today, is it's time to teach you how to fight. Now, I always get a little intimidated when I say that because I'm looking at Joe Kahapea. Joe Kahapea has trained all kinds of police, right? Sheriffs, you name it. All kinds of people in martial arts. If anybody knows how to teach people how to fight, it's Joe. And I have no, no knowledge of how to fight in the physical. But I'm here to tell you it's time to teach you how to fight in the spiritual. In the spiritual. Okay? So, the sword. It's about the sword. The sword is the only part of the armor, which we talked about last week, the only part of the armor that is offensive as well as defensive. And the sword is the word of God. The sword is the holy scriptures. Now, my very first international spiritual warfare war that I fought and had no idea what I was doing, I modeled how I fought after what Jesus did. I stopped, I studied. What did he do when he was tempted in the wilderness? The temptations of Christ. Most people are familiar with them, but what most people don't understand is that they have it right after his baptism. That's why I asked Pastor Harold to read that passage about Christ's baptism. Because it was right after Christ was baptized, and then he went into the wilderness for 40 days, and then, boom, he's tempted by Satan in the wilderness. So we're going to go back to the baptism for just a little while before we go into the temptations of Christ. Because they, t they tell us how they inform us on what the temptations involved. What was at stake? This is a little heavier message than normal. It's a little more theological than normal. I ask you to hang in there with me because what the Lord's with the revelations that he showed me as I was studying the scripture were really, I was going, wow, this is a new revelation for me. And, I, and so bear with me as I explain it to you. When John reluctantly baptized Christ, heaven opened, right? This pastor described, heaven opened. A dove descended on Jesus and remained, it says. And then the voice of God was heard. This is my son, with whom I am well pleased. That's it. That was the sum total of what he said. What happened? What happened in these, this one verse, Matthew 3, verse 17? First of all, the Holy Spirit anointed him. We know from anointing. Who's usually anointed? Kings, right? Royalty is anointed. With an anointing comes the authority and the power. Kings only have authority and power because they've been anointed as a king. It was the same with the priests. They had the anointing, they had the power and the authority to pray, to intercede directly with God in the Old Testament. Anointing, when the Holy Spirit anointed him, it was a declaration a declaration, a spiritual declaration of Christ's position of authority as the Messiah. It's important. It's very, very important. This is who he was. And the authority that carried this result. Secondly, the Father declared audibly, as well as spiritually, he said, this is Christ, this is his identity. His identity is he is my son my son. And thirdly, it was a, oh, 
by the way, God said, by the way, don't miss it, but I'm really pleased with this son of mine. That's what happened at the baptism. Christ's baptism was a public introduction. God introduced Jesus as his son, in whom he is well pleased, and this established Christ's identity. Do you feel like that's important? It is, especially when you go fast forward, he, then Jesus goes from that to the wilderness, and he then is there when he doesn't seek out the tempter, but the tempter seeks out him. Jesus is physically hungry, but spiritually full of the Spirit. And here comes the tempter, and he says to him in Matthew 4, verse 3, just the very next chapter, verse 3, he says to him, if you are the Son of God. Whoa. What did God just say he was? Who did God just say he was? This is my Son. And now, the very next thing we hear from the tempter's voice is, if you are the Son of God. Interesting? It's powerful. Don't miss it. He said, if you are the Son of God, command the stone to be turned into bread. Hmm. Turning a stone into a loaf of bread, easy for Jesus? Yes. Of course. Do you think that Jesus would have really been tempted to, to, that he would really question his identity? Probably not. I don't think so. So what was this all about? Hmm. What was it all about? What did Satan hope to accomplish? Something, something amazingly dire. Hmm. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it by turning this stone into a loaf of bread. What is at stake here is nothing more than Christ's identity, but also Bear with me, his mission on earth. If Satan had been successful, wait till you see what could have happened. If Christ had said, oh yeah, I'll prove it to you. Right? See, God, but God's son, Jesus, was worthy. He was worthy to be what we call, what I is, is the, group, the Greek in all the New Testament for lamb is amnos. Amnos. Every time you were to see what John said, Behold the Lamb of God, behold the Amnos of God, behold the Amnos of God, that who takes away the sin of the world. The only time that, that is not used is in Revelation, and there the word for Lamb in Greek is Arnios. It's very, it's very, and it took, it's, oh my goodness, she's going to Greek, because this is important. He was the, at this point, he is the Amnos Lamb, because the Amnos Lamb is a Lamb that was worthy to be slain. A lamb who is worthy to be a Passover lamb. A lamb who carried no bruising, no wounds, nothing. No blemishes. A perfect, blemish-free lamb is an Amnos lamb. Okay? That's who he was at that time. Now, don't th make, think I say he became a different lamb. No, it's just that he's, he, it was different after he was crucified, the bargaining sign becomes the lamb who is worthy to open the scroll because he has been slain. But now, at this point, he's referred to as the Amnos lamb because he's blemish free and he's worthy to be slain. If there had not been an Amnos worthy to be slain lamb, we would not have our salvation. Christ's identity as God's Son gave him the right to drink the cup of crucifixion. That's what gave him the right to drink the cup of crucifixion was the fact that he was blemish free. If Jesus had given in to the temptation to prove his identity, to say, oh sure, I can prove this, I'll just turn that stone into a loaf of bread. If he had just got done that, that little thing, and I think Satan thought, well, it's so easy and easy and he won't see it, he'll just go right ahead and do it. But if he had done that, 
If he had done that, he would have traded his right to die in our place for a stone turned to bread. Really? Yes. If he had yielded to the temptation to prove his identity, because this was Satan saying, if you really are, then you'll do this, right? If Jesus had said, okay, I'll do this, and had yielded to this temptation, it's called a temptation. It's called one of his temptations. If he had done that, Satan would have held it to the Father and said, ah, 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 he just yielded to one of my temptations. He's no longer blemish free. He's no longer perfect. So you can't, he no longer can die. He's no longer worthy to be slain. It's a big deal. This is a big deal. The temptation to prove his identity, if it had worked, which it didn't, would have negated Christ's right to stand in our place to defeat death once and for all. The thief. So what is this, what does this temptation teach us about today? In this spiritual war that God has called us to fight on behalf of delivering all the children of the world from him for Christ. First of all, we know that we see this. This is the very first temptation. Now, his temptation was to steal his identity and his right to die in our place, right? You get that. Do you not think that Satan is going to start with his, he's going to tempt with the thing that means the most to him? He leads, he's going to lead with that, right? With his strongest. Well, that's the first thing I take away from it. So what was he intent on doing? He's intent on stealing identity. He's intent on stealing identity. If Satan had been successful with his temptation, not only would we have lost the, our salvation for once and for all, but if Satan had been successful with his temptation, all our identities in Christ would also have been stolen for all eternity. We only have the identity as a child of Christ because Jesus resisted this temptation. You understand that? Are you following me? It's a little deep. I understand that. It's a little deep. I'm not just telling stories today. So what's at stake today? That's what was at stake when, when Jesus was tempted. But what's at stake today? An attempt to negate Christ's victory on the cross. Christ did have a victory on the cross, but Satan's like today going, yeah, but I can, I can negate the effects of that by stealing the identities of God's children. Hmm. Not just today, but for generations to come. This is a, this is a big thing we need to be aware of, church. Right? And it's important as we fight this enemy to unmask him and say, oh, we, we, uh -huh, guess what? We know what you're up to. Because when he knows he's been unmasked, he slithers away. He won't you. Yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest ways you can work. You can, you can defeat him. So today, I'm calling on, on this church, and, and the book is going to raise this awareness to beware. Be aware of his great deception because as he's attempting to steal the identities of all the children today, he's got us running after this little red herring over here. Now, of course, we care about this red herring. This has gotten our attention. We're really, really fired up about it as Christians and churches in the evangelical world. This red herring over here, and we're praying and praying and thinking, that's the big, that's the, what he's seek, seeking to kill and destroy. It's part of that, but, but that's not the real thing he's worried about. Satan is more, uh, he, his real attack is on their identity as God's children. Yes. Yeah. Who are created in God's image. Yeah. Yeah. And while we're busy praying over here against this red herring, we're not praying against this one. That he will not steal, he will not kill, he will not destroy. 
destroy their identity as his children who are made in God's image. Okay. And I'm talking about much more, including, but much more than gender identity confusion. I'm talking about true identity confusion. Because when the children, when the children know whose they are, there is no longer any identity confusion. Amen. You understand that? Yes, I'm not. Okay, you're all with me, right? Satan's goal is to steal all the children from their true identity, God's child, his strategies to redirect our prayers from praying against this attack, the, the attack of God's child, to merely praying against this attack on their gender identity. That's what I'm saying. And I say it after much prayer, and I truly believe it, because like I said, I'll say it again, in case anybody didn't hear me. <laughs> Sometimes people don't hear everything you say. When the children know who they are, all identity confusion is cleared up. Right? This other thing is a sleight of hand. Don't fall for it. All right? So you'll see in the book of the prayer guide, for identity, there is a prayer for identity, and it, and it is from Scripture, and it, it is all about... This is who you are. May all the children come to know that God loves them. God made them. They are made in His image. They are who God, they are who the, His Word defines them as beautiful, precious. He has a plan for their life. All of that is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. So at any rate. So then, so how did, how did Satan respond to this temptation? How did he resist it? He used scripture. He used scripture to fight Satan. He said, in this particular one, he quoted in Matthew 4, 4, it says, Man shall not live by bread alone. And that's a direct quote from Deuteronomy 8.3. I'm going to read the whole quote from Deuteronomy 8.3. Listen to this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but, here's the quote part, man lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. The word of the Lord, scripture, this is our source, this is our substance, this is the nourishment of our spiritual life, amen? amen. Okay. And we do not feed our identity in any food or any nourishment other than what God says who we are according to his word. Okay. So, Jesus used the word, Jesus used the word. The word was his sword. And I decided I'm going to do the same thing. And so Jesus always said, for all three of his temptations, it is written, and then he quoted all three from Deuteronomy. It is written, all three. It is written. The first one was, you, uh, you don't live a man, man does not live on the bread below. <laughs> Sorry, bread below. The second was, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the third one was, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So, in our war, we use scripture. In our war, we use, just like Jesus did, we use scripture, we use scripture, we use scripture. And that's the sword, the sword, the sword, the sword. The word of God is powerful. Let me read this to you from Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth? It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose. This is God talking. And shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So if we are decreeing and declaring God's word, we can have assurance in it. Yes, it is powerful. It is powerful. It accomplishes what God has set out for it to accomplish. It says right here, I'm not making this up. It's right there in Isaiah. Maybe in your notes, I don't remember. I ran out of room. I had so much to give you. The word of God is imperishable. It says in 1 Peter, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And in verse 25, Peter, as the word of the Lord remains forever. So when we decree and we declare God's word, wow. 
This is what delivers the children from identity confusion and all the other attacks. That's just one. That's just one. So sharpen your sword daily. How do I do that? I go, I have verses that I've given you a couple. I keep it sharpened by reading and decreeing aloud in the script. Scroll way down here. Here's some. Um, I will see, I will read scriptures. You, I've given you a few. The Lord is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. I'm confident that God will complete the good work he has begun in me. As I decree and declare these scriptures, my strength, right? My strength is sharpened. My prayer is sharpened. I'm sharpening that sword that God has given me on, and I'm sharpening it with the word. Sharpening it with the word. Then there are also prayer guides that I've given you. When we pray, when we pray, angels unsheath their fiery swords. I'll tell you two quick stories because time's already getting away from us. But they're in the scripture. There are three instances that I've been able to find. There may be more. There may, there's actually one other one which I've not included in them, where the where angels are depicted as having swords drawn. Swords drawn. Swords unsheathed. Amen? The first one was, well, this, this is the first of the three. It was in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 30 24, it says, after they fell, Adam and Eve, and they were kicked out of the garden, God put a, a, a guard, an angel, guarding the garden so nobody could get in ever again until the company returns and gets the new heaven and new earth. And that angel there is, is, is depicted with a drawn sword. Drawn sword. But then there's also the story of Balaam. Two quick stories. Both of them took place, interestingly enough. The first one, right before the children of Israel were delivered. We're all, this is all about delivering children. Interesting, right? But before the nation, the children of Israel were delivered from the wilderness and crossed over the Jordan into the Promised Land. And right before that happened, Right before that happened. Um, an enemy of God and an enemy of God's children, Balak. He summoned, he was summoned to curse God's nation, to curse God's children. Balaam, Balaam would do anything for money. Or we see that even in, in it's true. In 2 Peter, it says he, 2 Peter says that Balaam was someone who loved gain from wrongdoing. Okay? So anyway, Balaam is summoned by Balak to come and accept a commission to curse, to curse, curse God's children, right? Those kinds of things go on, all the way even to, to this day. It says in Numbers 22, however, so Balaam's on his way, he's on his way. I'm going to go get this money, I'm going to accept this commission, and I'm going to curse God's children. But on his way, it says, the donkey saw an angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword, in his hand, the donkey turned off the road into a field. Wow. I said, smart donkey. I would call him something else that means the same, but will not do so. Okay. Balaam, intent on getting his money for cursing God's enemy, he struck the donkey. Then again, they fell and found themselves in the, in the vineyard. In, in the field, and there, was, there was walls, and they were running through the Balaam and his donkey, and the donkey, and again, the angel comes from nowhere and stands there with the drawn sword, blocking the way. And the donkey pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. Balaam strikes the, her again. And then, when the donkey sees the angel blocking a uh, last time, Balaam struck her a third time with his staff, and then the donkey speaks. Donkey speaks. What have I done to you that you have struck me three times? She asked. You made a fool of me, Balaam responded. Balaam, although he was an international expert of magic, does not is not able to see the angel, but the donkey could. Balaam was stopped. He was stopped. He did not make it to Balaam. He did not curse the people of Egypt, of, of Israel because. An angel with a drawn sword stopped it from happening. Okay? Those two instances. 
This is shortly before they crossed over the Jordan into the Promised Land. God has angelic armies at his beck and call. Remember it says in Psalm 91, he commands these angelic armies to achieve his purposes. He does. It's right there in Scripture. So, take it from Scripture. It's what I do. It's never failed me. The second story is right after they have crossed Jordan into the Promised Land. And the first city that they have to take is Jericho. You all know the story of Jericho. You probably sang songs about it, right, when you were kids in Sunday school. The city of Jericho. And Joshua was about to lead the battle. And just as he came to the city, near the city, Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15 says this. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and said, Ooh, are you for us or are you one of my enemies? Joshua mistakes his man to be human, but this is what he replied. I'm neither. I am a commander of the army of the Lord. I have come now. So here's this being, an angelic commander with a drawn sword, who says, I have come, commander of the army of the Lord. I have come as the army of the Lord, commander with drawn sword. You all know what happened. They went around, they marched, and, right? They marched for seven days, and marched for seven days, and then on the seventh day, they blew the shafar seven times, and seven and seven and seven, all these seven things which indicate divinity, of course. But let us not forget the commander of the heavenly army with drawn sword and his angelic army that was there. You know, I never hear anybody talk about this, the, the, the defeat of the city of Jericho without mentioning the angelic army and the commander with a drawn sword. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to forget about a commander with a drawn sword of an angelic army. Especially not in this war that we are fighting today. Yeah. Both of these instances took place just as God was ready to deliver his nation, his children, from his enemies. Do you have any doubt? We are living in times that call for angels with drawn swords. Sent to fight and deliver the children of the world for Christ. You and I, we fight alongside these angelic warriors when we prayerfully proclaim God's word. It's all we are asked to do. But when we do, when we prayerfully proclaim and we pray God's word, that God's prayer is based on God's word, we are summoning angelic warriors with drawn swords. This is our part in fighting the good fight. This is why we keep our swords sharpened and unsheathed, and we take out the enemy as our prayers summon the angelic armies. So, in the prayer guide of the book, there's we give you scriptures to sharpen your soul, and I pray two or three every morning. I've already done a few of them for you. I've given some to you in your handout. We've also given you prayers to pray before you unsheath your sword. And so today I can just read one that I read this morning. God, you are my refuge and my strength. I pray victory over the nations and the children of the world. You raise your strong right arm in triumph. As I pray out loud, angels in heaven are activated to accomplish what you desire. Amen. And then today I want to close by praying the following prayer of deliverance for attacks against the babies in the womb. Okay? In the prayer guide I wrote introductions to each and every one of these. And I will read the introductions as well. Babies in the womb. God made wounds. 
They are his beautiful design to carry life that cannot yet breathe and exist on its own. Yet today the enemy has been attacking the wombs of women around the world. This makes sense as this is an attempt to stop babies from being born. The lives of unborn babies are uncertain. An unborn baby is lost every 34 seconds. Two prayers this morning that I will pray. The first is to cover the babies in wombs. Some women have had to suffer the pain of miscarriage and have lost babies to no fault of their own. Other babies have been lost because women have not taken care of themselves, even the babies in their wombs. Some babies are being exposed to substances in the womb that are irreparably damaging nervous systems. There are mothers who are taking the lives of the babies that are in their wombs, choosing convenience over concealing and covering and bringing life into being. There is also a prayer of mercy here for mothers who have already made such a life-ending decision. Here's the prayer for unborn babies. Just follow along with me as I pray. <clears throat> Father, there are babies that are being formed in their mother's wombs all over the world. In some parts of the world, the enemy has stolen the access to prenatal care. In some parts of the world, the enemy has stolen the value of unborn life. And in some parts of the world, the enemy is actively seeking to kill and destroy unborn life. And in all parts of the world, the enemy is intent on doing what he can to cause a disability, premature birth, and or health issues. But I see you, evil one, for who you are, a destroyer, thief, liar, and murderer, but no more. I speak with the authority God gave me as his child. In the name of above all names, Jesus Christ. And I declare that the evil one now has a divine restraining order been forced against him. I say to you, evil one, you are permanently denied access to these babies' lives and destiny. No weapon formed against these babies will prosper. Christ, you came to give your life to save your children, to give them life abundant, and that includes the unborn babies. Victorious Christ, ignite a burning love in the hearts of expectant mothers everywhere for the life and heart that beats within them. Rise up and give them the heart of a warrior, a ferocious faith to fight and protect the babies in their wombs. I decree and declare that the doctors, nurses, and health administrators will use their gifts and knowledge to fight for the lives of all babies. I trust your word, God, it is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Your word is a word of life. Your word says you created all these beings that are currently being formed in their mother's womb. You are knitting them in their mother's womb. As such, all these babies of yours are being fearfully and wonderfully made. Their frames are not hidden from you. You see their unformed bodies, and all the days of their life have been written in your book. You have a plan for their, these babies, and it is a plan for good, and it includes a future with hope. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And a prayer for mercy to erase a mother's guilt. You will hear me use the first person tense because it's written for a mother who has done this to read it. Okay, so I'm reading it on her behalf, any mother's behalf, who has who has not been faithful to protecting the life that was embedded within her. So on her be there, Lord, forgive me. Your love for me and your forgiveness for me is undeserved, which makes it all the more precious. The bigger the debt, the more gratitude we feel when that debt is completely erased. My mistake, my neglect, my choice, which led to loss of health and loss of life in some cases, and the baby that you embedded within me, has resulted in a debt that is far too big for me to pay. Yet you went to the cross, and in the process, you paid my price. You died for me. You showed your sacrificial love for me while I was still lost and rebelling against you. So I will not let your death be in vain. I will accept this priceless gift of mercy. 
I deserve forgiveness. And I will rejoice in a new life you are giving to me in this very moment. I will walk in freedom from guilt from this day forward. I will not let the lies of the accuser steal my freedom or my joy that I have because of your love for me. Hmm. My name is not guilt. My name is not unloved. My name is not shame. My name is daughter of the Most High God. I am loved. I am forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And stand for the benediction.
have our lovely, lovely brunch right outside. Come on, let's join together as a family and eat the brunch. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Happy birthday.